from the Children's Defense Fund that the rate of birth to black teens is twice that for whites. Women had 50% of all black families with children under 18 compared to 15% for white children. Only 41% of black children are living with both parents compared to 80% of white children and 70% of Hispanic children. So while it is true that, that white families are in trouble, that blacks are not the only ones who have children out of wedlock, the reality says that it, it's pronounced, it's exaggerated, it's concentrated in many respects it, among black families. Are you willing to admit that? Are we I'm, I'm not only willing to admit it, I think we've got to sound the alarm about it. And I think increasingly that alarm is being sounded from within the black community, and that is the important change I think that has occurred. Uh, there, there is no question that this is a phenomenon that stretches across the face of the United States, and I couldn't agree with Jesse Moore, that we have to deal with it in its national context. At the same time, uh, I think it is clear that it has reached crisis proportions in our community. When half of all the children are being born to single women who are disproportionately poor, we see the face of the next generation of black people. And if we keep this up, if we don't find a way to intervene, and it is so complex that intervention has got to take place on, on a number of levels, but if we do not find a way to intervene, we are going to see progressively greater disadvantage with each generation of black people, which is the antithesis of the American imperative. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. This is from the uh, New York Times, November 20th, 1983, the breakup of the black family in perils gains of decades. And this is um, an ex extension of uh, the results of the Monaghan Report. So this will be the Monaghan Report some almost 20 years later. And it reads as, occasionally the, today, 18 years later, virtually half of black families are headed by single women and 55% of black babies are born to unmarried mothers. Gun shy from the Monaghan experience, authorities for years were reluctant to speak out about the problem. But now politicians and scholars, black and white, liberal and conservative, openly agree that the situation has reached such proportions that it has threatened to undo black economic gains of the past three decades. The growing alarm among blacks. The breakdown of the traditional family structure is, they say, one of the underlying causes of black poverty, not only because there is no man to provide family income, but also because women on the average earn much less than men. Moreover, many black spokesmen are saying for the first time that this is the one of the most serious problems facing their communities and that it may mean that larger and a larger poor portions of coming generations of blacks will grow up to be disadvantaged. Huh, this is 83. <laughs> okay, even they didn't know what was going to happen. Eleanor Holmes Norton, a law professor at Georgetown University who was chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the Carter administration, termed the family crisis a threat to the future of black people without equal. The problem must be resolved, the experts say, because otherwise society at large will have to pay the price either in compensatory measures to prop up the fractured lives or in strife and social conflict as the gap widens between the privileged and the excluded. Ain't that the truth? An unmistakable correlation. It is an open question which is more important, 
The breakdown in family structure causes poverty or that poverty is a cause of the breakdown. But the correlation between the two is unmistakable and it is prompting a serious debate over the causes of the problem and a search for solutions. A study last summer by the Center for the Study of Social Policy, a nonpartisan research group, showed that in all races, families headed by women were twice as likely to as two parent families to be poor. Half of all families headed by black women have incomes below the poverty line, the study showed. The study noted that in 1981, the average income of black families with two working parents was 84% of the average for white families where both parents worked, an increase from 73% 13 years earlier. In contrast, a primary reason that the average income for all black families with children was just 56% of the average for whites, the study concluded, was that 47% of families were headed by women, (laughs) 70% now, as against 14% of white ones losses exceed gains monahan said that if we did if he said if we don't do something now it's going to get worse and what he said was the plight of the black family may be outside the control of the government to correct and he was actually right since black female-headed households are the most rapidly increasing proportions of all black families the fact that they have not gained economic ground has more than offset the increases made by the other types of black families, the report said. The principal author of the report was the director of the center, Tom Joe, who was a welfare official in the Nixon administration. Wow, that's that's going all the way back. In one sense, according to some experts, single black mothers may represent a, a vanguard. These experts suggest that more and more white women will become single parents as they build a longer tradition of working and financial independence. <sighs> Boy, this is like... Uh, They were like predicting the future. But the far-reaching effects on the black community might be mitigated among whites, partly because white women tend to get divorced less often than blacks and tend to marry more often. (laughs) I always say black women are the least married and the most divorced. And they said it right there. It's right there. You know, it's it's in stats, but they just read it. They just put it out there. This is 1983. The problems of single mothers, black and white, are compounded by the fact that working women, on average, earn less than men. According to the Census Bureau, the median earnings of working black women last year was actually slightly higher than those of working white women. 7,802 versus 7,640. But the average working man earned about twice as much. 15,373. Uh, that's not true anymore. White women make a lot more than they did back then. With the next generation, Miss Norton said, we could see a proportionally greater numbers of disadvantaged po- people than in this generation because of the proportion of children who get their start in life as children of single girls and women. Experts voice disagreement. While politicians and social scientists agree that the dissolution of the black family structure has been a main cause of poverty among blacks, They disagree sharply over why such disintegration has occurred and over the possible remedies. One camp, which includes many members of the Reagan administration, argues that the nation's welfare system has encouraged families split up, see it wasn't us, and has led to the state of welfare dependency for generation after generation of blacks. He's not too far away from that, okay, as far as being right. They would reduce government social programs, require able individuals on welfare to work, and place more emphasis on apprehending fathers <laughs> and forcing them to pay child support. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I, I, I lived through this transition, man, where they started uh, going after the so called dead be dead. This is the beginning of the dead be dead. And uh, this is 83 is actually when Nixon kind of took us out of austerity measures. Another camp comprising many liberals and most, but not all, black scholars believes that the causes are much more complex but center on the history of discrimination against blacks in this country and the inability of black men to find work to support their families. Did not Moynihan say that in 1965? Did he not say that the whole piece was about the the deadline was what the Moynihan was, was about back in 1965, right? 
and this is damn near 20 years later, they're still saying the same thing. They say the situation would be much worse if it, not, if it were not for the government welfare programs, and they would expand both these programs and various social services designed to counsel black families, discourage teenage pregnancies, and help single women with children to make it on their own. Uh, Bill Clinton tried to do that in 1996. Here are the arguments advanced by experts in both camps. Welfare. For many years, the nation's primary welfare program, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, denied benefits to families. If, the, if an adult male was in the house, did we not just say that? We had arguments for like four hours over this shit. Did not, this is 1983. They're saying that. That's the freaking man in the house rule. Black women had to choose checks over fathers. If they wanted the check, they had to put the father out of the house. That bar was stricken in 1968 and states were permitted but not required to recover two parent families in which a would-be breadwinner was unemployed or underemployed. Some people believe that the man in the house rule has contributed to family breakup by forcing fathers to leave the home. Others disagree. Mr. Joe, for example, noted that New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and 18 other states, which together account for 70% of the nation's families on welfare, offer aid that covers unemployed fathers in the home. Yet only about 300,000 such families are covered out of a national welfare case of 3.6 million, but we cover unemployed fathers. <laughs> Bullshit. War on poverty is blamed. The conservative economist George Gilder asserts that conservatives were right in their predictions that the income redistribution programs of President Johnson's war on poverty would result in destroying the incentives and families of the poor. In an attack this fall on what he termed the welfare state disaster, Mr. Gilder wrote, current programs will continue to create a criminal underclass of unlisted male welfare beneficiaries who exploit the welfare trap by living off a series of female recipients. <laughs> Hobosexuals, okay? This is when the hobosexuals were born and extended by violence ever deeper into the heart of our cities and our national consciousness. Mr. Joe, whose organization has been conducting a detailed study of the Reagan administration's 1981 cuts in welfare programs, said a dual system of family law, one for the rich, the other for the poor, was evolving. He cited as an example a new welfare regulation requiring, he said, that if a stepfather enters the home, he's liable for not only the support of the mother, but also of all the kids. Huh. That daddy season. He said this meant that a working man who wished to marry a woman on welfare would face the prospect of assuming responsibility for the support of children that were not his. That's like a lot of your millennials said, I'm not uh, playing cleanup man. Many states, New York among them, have had difficulty even defining what a stepfather is, Mr. Joe added. Poverty culture disputed. So-called overture poverty theories have long held that dependence on welfare can become so entrenched that it creates its own subculture with values that encourage remaining in poverty and attitudes that discourage self-reliance. Uh, we just, I just did a video a few months ago called the welfare cliff. So what they're saying is actually absolutely accurate. Okay, it's not a theory. This is not a an if or an instance or a wish or they're bullshitting because it is, it, this, is this, this article is in 1983, okay? This is 2022. That welfare cliff still exists. So what they're saying is 100% correct. A pioneering study by the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research, one of the few research projects that followed welfare recipients for many years, disputes such theories. Yeah, they can dispute it, but guess what? It's still with us. In a report released last month, the Institute said that at least among blacks, long-term welfare dependency as a child does not necessarily lead to long-term welfare dependency as an adult. That is true. Some kids do get off of it, but most don't. The Michigan study team headed by Dr. Martha S. Hill also found that while children from poor households are more likely to be poor as young adults, nevertheless, more likely, parental attitudes and values with few exceptions do not make any difference in the economic well-being of children after they leave home. One reason more black children than white children live in single parent families is a higher degree of teen age pregnancies among blacks. Among all unmarried women 50 to 19 years old in 1979, 
Blacks were 50% more likely than whites to have had sexual intercourse, according to a survey published by the uh, Alan Gutmeyer Institute and the National Institutes of Health. Gutmarker is actually a pretty good site uh, when they can keep their data up. Because if something negative, they will snatch that stuff off in a heartbeat. More than one in four blacks was born to a teenage mother in 1979, 25%. According to figures compiled by the Children's Defense Fund, a child advocacy group based in Washington, D.C., a the comparable figures for whites was one in seven. Interesting. The group found that the birth rate declined among single black teenagers in the 1970s, but it dropped even faster among older and married black women. Studies show that these groups are more likely to use contraception or have abortions than unmarried black teenagers. Yet black women do use abortion as birth control. Thus, the proportion of young single mothers uh, among blacks rose. That's how come they changed the law to actually allow teenagers to have abortions. In addition, sexual activity among blacks in this age group appeared not to be increasing. While such activity among white teenagers was growing rapidly, the good marker that he found conservatives cite welfare. Some authorities think that the government encourages teenage pregnancy by providing a haven for young mothers and by creating a dependency in people who otherwise would have to find some other way to survive on their own. If you look at the data, said Robert B. Carlson, President Reagan's advisor for social policy development, as the welfare system has gotten more expansive, there is a correlation between the growth of programs and explosions of families in the teenage age group. Hmm. Action reaction. He said the failure to form families in the first place was regarded by the administration as an even greater problem than family breakup. In other words, in the 60s, the families broke up. A mother, the marriages would happen, but the families in divorce would actually break up in and they, the man would have, be, have to leave the house. As it progressed, the second generation, second and third generation and on welfare, the families never formed in the first place. So that's that's one reason why the marriage rate actually dropped. Uh, the women didn't need the men. This is probably the toughest welfare problem there is, Mr. Carlson said, because the welfare system provides money, free medical care, food steps, and other things. A woman who has a child, if she's single, the question is, does that encourage or induce or in any other way cause the problem of teenage pregnancy? In other words, if you just can get all that stuff by having a kid and you can't get it any other way, just like a man going out and selling dope, it's easy for a woman to have a baby, especially if you're poor. Marion Wright Edelman, president of the Children's Defense Fund, blamed the relaxed sexual mores that have evolved in American society in the last 20 years or so particularly the sexually charged messages of the contemporary entertainment, motion pictures, televisions, and popular music. The message they convey to children as anything goes, she asserted. Some scholars assert that the poor economic prospects of black teenagers may have wrought a fundamental change in mores in the black community. Uh, say that again for the people in the back. Dr. Harriet Pice McAdoo, I like that name, Sociologist at Howard University who has specialized in the study of disadvantaged women and children said, the tradition used to be that if a woman got pregnant, they were expected to get married, huh, shotgun marriages, if not forced to get married, to supply income and a name for the child. But if the man has no job, there's no impetus for them to get married. Say it again for the people in the back. Her parents would have three people to support instead of just two. The boy would become an additional burden on the family. Parents feel, why should I force you to marry him? He'll be a drain. Whites more often marry. A study by the National Center for Health Statistics, the only available research on the subject, found that in 1972, 49.5% of white women who conceived out of wedlock married before their babies were born. For black women, the figure was 11.7%. <laughs> Oh, the figures were not broken down by age. Oh, Lord. Oh, sometimes I just want to stop reading and, 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 and uh, pull the covers over my head. The Children's Defense Fund also cites limited research based on reports from eight states in 1979, showing that among all pregnant teenagers, 41% of whites had abortions, while only 26% of blacks did. But among pregnant older 
in married women, blacks were almost twice as likely to have an abortion as whites. The research showed, yeah, because uh, black little black teenagers couldn't afford abortions. They make them much cheaper. A number of policy analysts believe that the underlying cause of the increase in black families headed by women is the sharp increase in the joblessness of black men. Uh, Monahan Report said that. The name of the game is not marriage. The name of the game is income, said Mr. Joe, author of the recent study that addressed black poverty. That has proven not to be true. Even as uh, the job market for black men stabilized, um, welfare continued to, to, to go up. I don't know if that's because the culture of uh, unemployment amongst black men, but the thing is, whatever it is, black men's unemployment, employment or unemployment has little to no effect on welfare in a black community, has almost had little, little to no effect on the marriage rates. In fact, what really has been the effect on marriage rates and, and uh, out of wedlock births is not black male unemployment, it's actually women's the more money women actually get is a factor. And plus the changing mores in, in sexuality, plus also feminism. It's, it's more than just more than just that. Anyway, let's continue. And the joblessness is reflected not simply in the unemployment recorded in monthly government figures, which is never less higher for blacks than for other major ethnic groups. It also includes the growing numbers of discouraged workers who have given up looking for jobs and the black men in America's, America's cities and rural areas who lacking jobs and permanent addresses are not counted by census takers. Among black teenagers, the unofficial unemployment rate hovers around 50%. But according to Sar A. Levitan, an employment analyst, only one sixth of them have jobs because so many have dropped out of or never joined the labor force. Women as breadwinners from 1960 to 1982. Families headed by black women as a percentage of all black households with children rose to 47% from 21%. Remember, Monaghan actually said it was like 23%. Over the same span, the percentage of employed black men plunged to 55% from 74%. Some studies suggested that black men who cannot be enumerated by census takers were ad added to the total. The result would show that fewer than half of all adult black men in the country have jobs. Now, that's pretty extreme, but who knows? Even those black men who do work earn significantly less than white men, an average of 10,510 last year against 15,964 for white men. Um, that's like, what, uh, two thirds? I think the gap is narrowed, but that hasn't done anything for the uh, out of wedlock birth rates or even black marriage. Conservative theorists, including many in the Reagan administration, argue that the main cause of high joblessness is not discrimination, but rather absence among many blacks of basic working skills. Monahan said the same shit, man, 20 years earlier. Jesus Christ. Administration officials say blacks should emulate the experience of those aliens in this country illegally who started in the lowest level jobs and worked their way up through the system. That's the bootstraps. But many who have had studied the problems of the black families say historic and continuing discrimination against black men robs many of the ability to function as the family breadwinner. The present black family crisis characterized chiefly by the precipitous growth of poor female headed households can be traced almost directly to American racism, said a report by 30 black scholars who met in Terrytown, New York earlier this year. The group ranked the issue of the black family equally with the economy and education as the critical concerns of the black community. In other words, the problem never got fixed. Monahan said the problem would, would uh, continue for at least another generation if it didn't get fixed. In fact, he didn't know it would be three. He used to say, you're going here, there, and everywhere, and I'm going nowhere. Miriam, an executive secretary, said of a, her former husband. He just didn't have any drive. I was moving ahead, and he was moving backwards. After a while, he couldn't take being bested by a woman. He started to hate me, but most of all, he hated himself. Some psych psychiatrists regard such a reaction as a classic response to a, a sense of futility that grows within many black men and boys when they believe the cards are stacked against them. Dr. James Cormer, the Maurice Falk Professor of Child Psychiatry at Yale University's Child Study Center in New Haven, said many black men came to feel that instead of trying against the high odds and failing, it was better not to try. Uh, it's still with us. Uh, this is pretty long. I'm going to read it all. You know, the hell with it. 
In a society, the male is supposed to be the breadwinner, he said. Did not Monaghan said almost the same thing. Something that's still deep in our psychology. It's a tremendous psychological burden when you know when you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of taking care of your family. One of the defenses is not to care, to not do, not try. Sounds like Yoda. Dr. Cormer said the American system to justify itself had to rationalize its abuses of blacks. Therefore, he said it has to not only deny the black male, but also to destroy him, put him down, make him look stupid, inadequate, and weak. Moreover, he maintained men who see no opportunities for making it in the job market and of establishing themselves and seeing themselves as inadequate often seek adequacy in adulthood as male by producing a baby. And sometimes females also often seek to prove that they are someone of worth and value by producing a child. That is very true. They actually did uh, studies with that of called Promises I Can Keep in Philadelphia. Mr. Carlson, President Reagan's assistant, said the administration was concerned with avoiding writing off persistently jobless black men as a hardcore unemployed. But the fact of the matter is that they're not going to be able to get any jobs that are there because of these basic skills they lack that they lack. He said, adding that the fact so many illegal aliens are coming in, uh, thank you, Ronald Reagan, and on the bottom rung and going up the ladder, that's evidence that you've got to have those basic skills. In fact, those Hispanics those, uh, learn those basic skills where? Where they come from. They bring those skills with them. If you're ever down there, you notice that they bring those skills with them. Black women have been in the workforce in large numbers for much longer than white women. After World War II, millions of blacks left the southern farms. After World War II, millions of blacks left southern farms. Great migration. The women often recruited to work as maids for northern whites. The men work in factories. Mechanization began to eliminate sharecropping, the economic system that replaced slavery in the South. <sighs> you know what? This article is just saying all the stuff I've been saying over the last eight years. The consequences were widespread. Black families and communities that had functioned as economic and social units for decades on the farm were cut adrift and scattered. An extended family structure survived from African, African traditions and its attendant values will largely succumb to the impersonal isolation of the cities getting out of the home, even among the middle class for which white women has customarily meant staying home to care for family. For the family, black women's income has usually been needed to keep the family at middle income level. As a result, black women earlier than other women have made the next step of having and supporting children independently. Over the past 20 years, white women's participation in the labor force has been catching up and has now passed that of black women. In fact, they took the jobs from black men and gave them to white women. It's another point they don't point out. In 1960, 43% of black women were employed against 34% of whites. In 1970, it was 44% of black women against 40% of whites. And last year, the proportion of black women uh, leveled off at 44.8% while the figure for white women jumped to 48.4%. That's where the jobs went, folks. The jobs went to white women. And the jobs that went to white women were taken from whom? Huh. As white women have entered the labor force, the percentage of female-headed households among whites, while much smaller than blacks, has risen, and at a rate almost as rapid. Huh. Not only was Monaghan right, he was also right about white women. Among white families, 2.8% were headed by uh, women in 1950, 6% in 1960, 13% in 1982, compared with 8.3%, 20%, and 47% for blacks in those years. Less of a stigma, social stigma has been attached to a woman as a single parent in the black community than in the white one. Ms. Edelman, Ms. Edelman actually wrote the, the, the book, uh, Promises That I Can Keep. Mrs. Edelman of the Children's Defense Fund said it's more acceptable to have a baby than to have an abortion, in part because of strong religious views amongst many blacks. Well, that's not the case anymore. Now there are signs that the stigma is declining in the white community as more middle class white women choose to openly have babies without husbands. Also, the white divorce rate has risen in step with women's financial independence. Huh. I wonder. I wonder where that comes from. Can we say white man's MRA? Hmm. With the result, 
that more white women too are single parents as a the result of divorce, but white women more often remarry than black women do. And the percentage of divorced black women is double that of whites. <laughs> You can't make this shit up. A, a publication released in August by the Rand Corporation, the California research company, noted that in 1982, fully 21% of all families with children were, were one-parent families. Rand cited research showing that demographers estimate that 46% 46, 46 of children born in the late 1970s will spend some part of their youth in one-parent families. Controversy is growing about potential remedies to the breakdown in the traditional black family structure. Some analysts, primarily but not exclusively, political conservatives argue that governmental programs have undermined the nuclear family structure. They say poor people, generally in blacks in particular, would be better off without such intervention. Mr. Gilder, the conservative, conservative economist maintains, for example, Illegitimacy means that sons will be brought up in homes where money is seen as always inadequate entitlement to women from the state. Many of these youths express no comprehension of the requirements of a job. Most have hardly ever met a working man who supports his children. They will find their manhood not by emulating adults, by, but by fierce street rival rivalries with their peers. But, he continues, any girl offered an irresistible solution by the U.S. government it presents her at age 16 a chance for independence in an apartment of her own, free housing, med medicine, legal assistance, and a combination of payments and food stamps were several hundred dollars a month. There's only one c crucial condition. She must bear an illegitimate child. Can't make this shit up, folks. Anyway, we're almost done. Others, including civil rights groups and most political liberals, argue that without such existing income, educational and social supports flawed though they are the situation would be much worse and that such assistance must be strengthened rather than abandoned workfare plan debated the Reagan administration is promoting a community work experience program or workfare as federally financed program to put unemployed to work for local public agencies in return for their income payments mr carlson the presidential aide said low skilled jobs in park depart parks departments, for example, would equip the jobless with the, the work habits they need to make them employable by private industry. Others argue that black workers have once again been dis disproportionately displaced by major structural changes in the employment market, similar to the demise of the Southern agricultural economy, and that it is inequitable to advance the solution that they start again on the bottom rung. In other words, they're mimicking what happened in the 60s and the 80s. John Jacob, the president of the National Urban League, observed that important sources of jobs for blacks were lost in the decline of the automobile, steel, and rubber industries, and said that these will require a national industrial policy to replace, to develop a workforce that won't be outpaced by the high rate of technological Development requires a strategy in which we are continually retraining our workforce for the new jobs constantly coming on stream. The Terrytown Group, which included Dr. Kenneth B. Clark, shout out to Dr. Clark, that was um, one hand's main man, the sociologist, Dr. Bernard Anderson, director of social services for the Rockefeller Foundation, Patricia Roberts Harris, former secretary of housing and urban development, HUD, and of health and human services, that's welfare, said governmental assistance programs for poor mothers in particular need to be completely reconceptualized and redesigned. Mrs. Norton, the Florida Carter administration jobs official, shout out to uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, and other black spokesmen, including officials of the Urban League, are endorsing a concept of incorporating job training into the welfare system so that women can graduate and do self-supporting work. In addition, a few private institutions have started experimental programs working with teenage mothers, teenage fathers, and older women who had families. The Ford Foundation, for example, operates a trial program in Harlem in which women with babies are assigned older, more experienced women to teach them not only practical skills, but also maturity and responsibility. Mrs. Edelman has begun calling on black community organizations, starting with churches, fraternal groups, and women's 
professional groups to provide support, guidance, and counseling and role models to poor black families. Such efforts would be particularly directed at teenagers similar to the Big Brother and Sister programs, the need for a opportunity. But Ms. Edelman said there would never be a solution to problems like teenage pregnancy until black youngsters, mainly female, were able to see brighter futures in the form of demonstrable economic opportunity for black people. Opportunity means hope. The bottom line is too few black parents have been able to show children if you are upright, you would do well in the society. Franklin Thomas, president of the Four Foundation, said for years you might have thought there was a taboo in even discussing the problem, but it's clearly gone. It's a recognition of how serious the problem is. That, my folks, is a long-winded reading of this article. But um, this was actually sent to me by Art Vidmore. All this stuff is confirms exactly what was the problem back in 1965. It never got solved. In fact, we're still talking about that problem. This is 40 years ago. It's almost 40 years ago. We're still talking about the same problem. We're still arguing about the same things that we argued about back in, no, uh, back in 1965. It never got fixed. It may never be able to be fixed. So saying that the Monaghan Report is debunked it's only been highlighted and amplified by multiple scholars over multiple years. This one article, how many people did we name saying the exact same thing that Moynihan said back in 1965? Come on, folks. Stop the cap. Anyway, with that, I'm going to bounce off of here. This is BGS. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.